Jesus is mine Wherever I have to go When the storm clouds rise, even when my faith is tried, Jesus will light up my way, give strength for today. All of the time, I'll just be fine. Jesus is mine. So when the hard times come by, tears fill my eyes, joy is deep inside, I can tell you why, oh I know, that Jesus loves me, all of the time, Jesus is mine, Jesus is mine. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath to all of you. Thank you for coming to Sabbath School um, this morning. I know it's raining on the outside, actually just drizzling, but wet on the outside. Um, it is my hope that the Lord will pour out much blessings upon us so that it rains here in the inside upon us in the forms of his divine favors and his blessings. At this time, <clears throat> we'll begin our Sabbath school program with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another Sabbath day of rest. Lord, you have said to us, let them make a sanctuary so that you could dwell in our midst. Lord, we have come into your house of praise to worship you. We ask, O oh Father, that you will dwell in our midst this day and grant unto us a Sabbath day's blessing. As we seek to lift up your name in praise and thanksgiving and share the, uh, share the good news of salvation and uh, 
uplift each other with the message of the, today's lesson. I pray, O oh Lord, that you'll be the chief presider in our midst. Teach us what we do not know. Grant unto us your discerning spirit, enabling us to discern, learn, and understand the things you desire for us to, uh, to learn so that we can gain a fuller knowledge of your divine will, plan, and purpose for our lives. We ask these favors in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll begin this morning with song number one. <clears throat> Song number one in your hymnal. <clears throat> Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. like to open with a psalm, one of the psalms are featured in this week's lesson, Psalm 96, and the psalm begin with, uh, of course this is a song from uh, the days of the uh, Israelites um, during, their, the, during the United Kingdom, of course, and uh, even uh, centuries later. So it begins, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name, show forth his salvation day unto day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all people. And now move down to verse 7. Give unto the Lord, ye families of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. I've, uh, while reviewing the lesson for this week, um, uh, this, another song comes into my mind, and uh, I thought I would share this song with you. Um, it says, Ascribe to the Lord. It is based, of course, on this passage of Scripture. <clears throat> Ascribe to the Lord, O oh mighty one, ascribe to the Lord glory and 
and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Come and sing praises to the rock of all ages. Come and sing praises to Jesus our Lord. Bow down before him, worship and adore him. Come and sing praises to Jesus our Lord. Now you have this, uh, the lyrics of this song in your hand, so I would like us to sing together uh, this time so that my voice does not, uh, how, <laughs> well, let's just say I'm not ready for prime time, so if you sing with me, it will be better. So, <clears throat> are you ready? Okay, let's try. Ascribe to the Lord, O mighty one. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Come and sing praises to the Lord of all ages. Come and sing praises to Jesus our Lord. Bow down before him, worship and adore him. Come and sing praises to Jesus our Lord. Okay. Uh, thank you for joining me in uh, singing this song. At this time, <clears throat> our, we have a panel for today, but I should uh, inform you that uh, unfortunately, um, the lead panelist uh, is not here as yet. And um, that's partly because uh, he has uh, a death in the family. He's currently in bereavement. And so um, we will, of course, go on. And I will try to fill in as best as I can. And so is Elder Gill. Um, but anyway, we will uh, begin with the lesson study for this week. And of course, <clears throat> Our lesson is about um, uh, giving praise to God and uh, the unending praise. Uh, I think if I can find it on my iPad. Um, yes, worship that never end. Okay, unending praise. Worship that never ends. All right, thank you. Um, so, uh, if you don't mind, I would like us to begin with the... Um, what is it, the opening text or the memory text, which is found in Psalms 104, verse 3. Uh, let's read it together um, after you found it. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. And this is the gist of the lesson for this week. Uh, giving praise to God, or uh, being in a state of unending praise. Now, I must confess, I'm not, uh, how shall I put it, I'm not the, um, the best uh, in obeying this command to give unending praise to God. Um, Paul tells us in the New Testament, in all things give thanks. Sometimes, I must confess, that's hard. When bad things happen um, to us, it's hard to give praise, uh, especially at that time. Uh, most recently, um, I was, uh, was, it, I was uh, hired as a contract worker at a company here in Greensboro. 
and I, I was faithful in providing the service for which I was contracted. And uh, at the end of that contract, I calculated the hours that I had worked, and um, I sent the calculations to the individual who hired me, and she gave me a check. I brought the check to the bank, and a few days later, the check was recalled. I checked with my bank, and I was like, I was shocked. This has never happened to me before. I mean, I bounced a check when I miscalculated the balance of my account, but I've never been paid, and then the payment was recalled. So at that time, I was not very happy, and I was not thankful either. But the thought came to me, even then, in all things give thanks. And I said to myself, well, Lord, you said it, and I don't know why I should give thanks at this time for this reason, but hey, I'll go ahead and do it anyway. So I said, Lord, thank you for this trial I must experience. So I let a week pass, feeling that maybe she will notice what had happened and, of course, correct the matter. Well, a week passed and nothing. So I decided to sit down and write her a letter. And I was very, how shall I put it, assertive in expressing my right to what I believe I was owed. But I was not disrespectful. I tried to do it in a very Christ-like manner, but of course to, be, to exercise my right to at least know why the check was recalled. It turns out that she herself did not know that the, uh, that the check was recalled. And when she inquired, it turns out that she herself had made some errors in, in calculation. And, uh, but needless to say, she, was, uh, she had no hesitation in writing me a new check and covering the cost or the fee that the bank charged for that transaction. So, in all things, give thanks. Now, I recognize that looking back at that situation, I realized I had the right to cuss and fuss, but I didn't. And in the end, she paid me, and then she said to me, I look forward to the next period when we can have your service again. So, I gave thanks at a time when I was not in the mood to give thanks, but the Lord found a way to bless me. And so, yes, by sometimes we are not in that mood. But a command of God is not subjected to our moods. A command of God is required at all times. In all things, give thanks. And that is the gist of our lesson for this week. And so I will join the panel at this time and uh, see if I can help in presenting a good uh, lesson for today. Uh, good morning, and so we continue with our, our lesson, uh, Worship That Never Ends, uh, with this focus on worship, and I am Elder John, and so I would be looking at worship in the sanctuary. Uh, on the Sunday, it is entitled... Lift up your hands in the sanctuary. And so, Psalm 134, verse 1 says, Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Mount Zion. He who is maker of heaven and earth. That's Psalm 134. So, from the get-go, this psalm is directed to a particular group of individuals. It is addressing those who serve in the sanctuary. So, who are the individuals that we have serving in the sanctuary? We have the priests, 
and we have the Levites. We have the singers that attend in the sanctuary, the, the sons of Korah. And so this psalm is directed to these individuals. And they are asked to lift up hands in the sanctuary. And who are they blessing when they are holding up their hands in the sanctuary? They are blessing the Lord. Now, the question then comes to us, since we do not have the sanctuary as it was back in the Old Testament times, how do we fit in in terms of worshiping God in church? Is the psalm referring to us also? Now it is speaking about the priests who serve in the sanctuary. The question then remains, are we priests? Do you consider yourself a priest? Am I a priest in the sight of the Lord? Or am I, are we to ignore this particular psalm and say that it does not refer to us? Well, let's see if we can draw ourselves into this equation. Could someone read for us? Uh, I could ask one of my um, associates here. First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Because, you know, we can say, okay, this psalm just referred to the Levites and the priests. That doesn't cover us. And so, but we need to know where do we fit in. Because this whole lesson is dealing with worship. How we worship God. How does God desire us to worship him? And so, First Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. First Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, you and I, we are identified as priests. Of God, And so this injunction to lift up holy hands in the sanctuary also applies to us. And so it is an act of worship. Simply that is what it's saying, lifting up holy hands. It's an act of worship that we are doing when we come into God's presence and we worship him. And one of the lessons uh, for the week will cover more of the aspect of what does it mean to have holy hands and who can uh, abide in the sanctuary. So I will not go into that at this time. But this lesson about worship in the sanctuary is that if we are priests, then we ought to have holy and live holy lives. Amen. In order to lift up a holy hand, the body must be holy. And so we are to therefore strive to have our lives covered by the blood of Christ so that we can be holy as his people, as his priests. Therefore, if we, have, if we are covered by the blood of Christ, if we are uh, in that relationship with him, it means that we would be accounted as holy. Therefore, we can now lift up holy hands. And as I said, a little more would be said in regard to the individual, uh, and I believe that may be on the Thursday's lesson when it comes to um, the individuals that stand in the sanctuary. So we will not touch on that. But we will skip over to our next uh, lesson in worshiping with a new song. Worshiping with a new song. Uh, Elder, before you go further, mm -hmm. uh, I know you... Worshiping a new song that is uh, it's Monday, but uh, the lesson asks here uh, in uh, how many, how are the worshipers depicted here, right? 
And uh, the question I would like to ask the congregation and even us here on the panel, how many of us believe that God hallows this place with his presence? We come to worship God here every Sabbath. But how many of us believe that God's presence is here? By the show of hands. Amen. Amen. I see the majority of us showed our hands. So uh, as we come to worship God, as the elder said, that uh, you know, we, we, we worship God in his sanctuary, and this is the church which is termed his sanctuary, right? We have to worship God in spirit and in truth. We don't offer sacrifices as burnt offering, and we offer a spiritual sacrifice. So we must make sure that when we come into his presence, because God is holy, everything in his presence is supposed to be holy. Y'all believe that? Yes. That's right. You know, we must leave everything at the door before we come into God's presence. All of our thoughts and everything about the world and should go before we come into God's presence. Or else we would be uh, nullifying our worship. We wouldn't be giving God the, the, the praise that he's supposed to receive. Amen? So this is what we must understand, and, and this is a practice. Uh, 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 every week we come in God's presence, we are repeating something that would become natural to us because we are preparing for heaven, where we're going to worship God in his sanctuary, and we're going to worship him all the time. This is what the lesson started, worship that never ends. That is where we're going to have worship that never ends. So it's a, it's a, a, a practice that we, you know, there's a, a word that says uh, repeating something makes perfect. I, I can't remember the practice, saying says. Practice makes, practice makes perfect. You know, so this is a practice that we are doing every Sabbath when we come. Amen? Uh, I, would like to, I would like to add as well. Oh, uh, uh, Dr. Legrand has a thought. Oh, don't worry. I'm here to pass the mic around. We can also look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, but ye are a royal, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, people, that you can show forth the praises of God, of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So again, we're royal priests. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Legrand. Um, I would I also like to add that um, when God called Abraham, I mean, it's easy for us to get fixated with the specific location or geographic location for worship. But actually, starting from the time when Abraham was called, after he was called and God told him to leave and go to a place he knew not of, the first place he reached where he stopped and he rest, he built an altar and he worshipped. This was customary throughout Abraham's life. Wherever he went, he moved from place to place, from, uh, uh, was it from Haran to Bethel and from Bethel to, you know, other places, he built an altar and worshipped God. In fact, when God spoke to Abraham, it was at one of those altars when God appeared unto him and spoke to him. Uh, additionally, uh, Jacob, uh, when Jacob left uh, his family and was on his way to, uh, to Paran, the Paran Aram, the, um, the, his, uh, Paran Aram, thank you, uh, his uh, in-laws, the Bible says he stopped he put a rock under his head and he slept. And as he slept, he had a dream. And as he woke up and understood the dream, he says, this is nothing but the house of God. Amen. So the house of God, I mean, today we don't have a temple uh, where, you know, the, what we call corporate worship is normally carried out except for the church. 
But we don't have to wait until once a week to worship God. Because like Jacob in, you know, on his way uh, en route to his uh, in-laws, he worshipped God. He found a place to worship God. When God appeared to him in the dream with the ladder, this, that too was the presence of God. So wherever God's people dwell, wherever God's people call on him in sincerity and truth, that place is a holy place because God's presence is there. Amen. So wherever we are, where, uh, the only th the, um, what makes the difference between a holy place and a secular place is God's presence. This too was, uh, again, um, uh, demonstrated with Moses in the cave. When Moses went to find, uh, uh, at, I think he was looking for his rod, and uh, he saw the burning bush, God told him, take off your shoes because the place where you stand is holy ground. Okay, so okay. our house can become holy ground. Thank you. All right. Let's, let's see if we can uh, get back to um, uh, some of the aspects of worship in uh, this week's lesson. And one of these aspects of this never-ending worship uh, worship is singing a new song. Amen. Singing a new song. And uh, we have six uh, different psalm referenced on the Monday section. And the call to a new song involves an individual. So it's a call for an individual to sing a new song as you read through these different psalms. Also, it's a call to the assembly or the congregation to sing a new song. Uh, it's in the sanctuary, it's at home, it's in the hills, it's along the seacoast, it's in the far countries, it's on the islands, it's a call everywhere to sing a new song. And so I ran through these uh, different um, passages and I realized that Psalm 33 calls for the upright to praise God with a new song, with instruments, uh, giving a hint to also in the assembly, uh, and a call for a new song to the creator, God, judge, and deliverer. Psalm 40 is more of a personal call that was given. He says, he put a new song in my mouth. And so this one is more of a testimony um, that the psalmist is given. Then we have Psalm 96, a new song of praise to the Lord for salvation, for glory, for his majesty and his honor, and in worshiping the Lord. And so this uh, includes both individual worship of a new song and the congregation. Psalm 98, sing a new song for the marvelous things that God has done. Amen. Uh, and then we have uh, Psalm 144, praise God for uh, his position, where David praised God for his position as king, uh, for the strength that God gave him, for the goodness of God towards him, uh, because he called God his fortress, his high tower, his deliverer, his shield. And, and then we also have Psalm 149, praise to the Lord, sing unto him a new song. Now, this, this, this motif, this idea, this uh, theme of a new song is rather interesting. Um, the reason for a new song, the, the lesson says, is a fresh recognition of the Lord's majesty and sovereignty over the world and a guarantee for his care and salvation. Uh, some of the actions I looked at in these psalms that refers or uh, reference the reason to, to uh, sing a new song is that God is creator, he is savior, he is protector, he is provider, he is judge, he is a source of blessings, he is healer, he is peacemaker. But I want to give my own definition of what I believe a new song is based on what I have gathered from the different texts and through the lesson. I put it this way, a new song is a now expression of a now experience of God's actions, whether those actions are present, past, or future. And so, this, the, the, the Psalms call for a new song. 
It leads me to believe then that we have old songs, Amen. True. old experiences, but he's now calling for a new song. And I know that um, most of us, some of us may be songwriters present here or looking online. Some of us may be musicians. But how in the world do I sing a new song if I am not a songwriter? And so the essence of it is that a new song is simply our experience with God in this present moment. That's what makes it new. Because today is a new day. At this present time, it's 1019. But we had a 1019 yesterday. We have a 1019 coming up tomorrow a.m. But it's not the same. Tomorrow it will be a new day. Mm. So today, I am able to sing a new song because, why? God woke me up this morning. I made it safely to church by God's grace. Amen. Hence, I can sing a new song. And so the new song is simply that. Born, one that is born out of a, a living relational experience with God. Amen. And so each time I have a new experience, I am singing a new song. But it goes beyond that. This new song, I may sing a new song about my past experiences, yes. where God brought me from. I can sing a new song based on someone else's experience because they have shared their experience. Now I know what they are going through and what God did for them yes. so that I can now glorify God with them. Amen. That's what praising and worshiping is about and singing a new song. But I can also... Praise God with a new song because, look, I believe one of these days I shall live and not die. Mm. I will see my father again. So I look forward to the new Jerusalem, to meeting Jesus. And so I have a new song that I can sing about all of this. And so the new song is simply about, we can even say, my new testimony, mm. my new experience that I have in the Lord. So how many of us may have just woken up with a song on our hearts? You just wake up with a song and that song is with you because it was born out of some experience you had. And if, if I were to ask you what song you had and I will get different songs from each individual, but the question remains so that as we try to get in more of the other lessons, the question remains, when you and I look back over our life and we consider all the blessings that God has done for us, what is that new song that you think about? Mm. Many, many years ago, this song came to my, I heard this song by, I think it's Yolanda, Innocent. Mm. A simple song. Isn't God good? Isn't he mighty? And, and, and that song just pops into my mind when I see a sunset, when I see flowers, and I like flowers, I love nature, when, when, when somebody cuts me off in traffic and I escape an accident, I, I usually just say to myself, isn't God good? Amen. Because that song means that to me. Now, I may have sung that several different times, but each time I sing it with a new experience, I am doing what the psalmist is asking. I am rendering to God a new song. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, just to add to what the elder was saying here, uh, Psalms 50, 23, the psalmist uh, says that the Lord said, Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. And one thing we have to understand, uh, we can sing a new song every day yes. oh, yeah. because God gives us new blessings every day. Yes, sir. Amen? And it doesn't mean that you have to sing a literal song. It's yes. praises yes, it to is. God. This is what the new song is about. Praises to God, right? The Lord uh, desires us to make mention 
of his goodness and tell of his power. He is honored by the expression of praise and thanksgiving. This is why God created us, right? And as he blesses us every day, we are to give him praise and thanksgiving. We are not to keep quiet. Yes. God expects us every day to give him praise because he does something for us new every day. Something new every day and we must give him praise. Tell somebody, let somebody know. You know, sometimes God do good things to people and people, they don't want to open their mouth and talk about it. Yeah. But God wants us to tell people, tell people of his goodness. That is what he glorifies in, to us giving him praise. Amen? Amen. Amen. You go ahead. You finish, Ella? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I, I just want to continue uh, on Monday's lesson where it says, uh, what can we infer about the new song from these biblical texts? And uh, the, the, uh, the Ella didn't mention these texts was... Isaiah 42, 10 to 12, Revelation 5, 9, and Revelation 14, 3, right? But the, 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 the pen of inspiration says that there's a day about, a day just about to burst on us when God mysteries will be seen and all his ways vindicated. When justice, mercy, and love will be the attributes of, of his throne, when the earthly warfare is uh, accomplished and the saints of all gathered home, our, our first, uh, sorry, our first theme will be the song of Moses, mm. the servant of God, and the second theme will be the song of the Lamb, the song of grace and redemption that will be louder than the song of Moses. So, you know, even though, you know, when we look back at what God has done for Israel and the children of Israel, we must understand that a day is coming when we're going to be able to make so much noise that it would be greater than when the children of Israel uh, were, were rescued and, and, and uh, being able to sing the song of, of Moses. Right? It says here that a new song can depict a fresh song that no one has ever heard before. A song that commemorates a vivid experience of God's grace in one's life. The new song also expresses hope, in which case the newness of the song is demonstrated in the anticipation of the unique, unprecedented experience of God's majesty in the future. True worship goes beyond sacrifices and offerings and reflects a living relationship with God. That is always fresh and dynamic. In a sense, one could simply say that the new song is a new expression, even each day, of our love and appreciation for what God has done for us. And I must say this. We don't only have to come into the household of God, the place of worship, to sing a new song. It could be done in our homes because when we worship God and, and I, uh, you know, this is something that we as God's people must understand that God gave us an example in, his, in the Bible of his people worshiping in the morning and the evening. And we must follow in that example. Worship God in the morning and in the evening. So when we come, you know, we worship in the morning we praise him and glorify him for giving us life another day. Right. We go on the road on the busy highways and byways, miss accidents and all of this stuff. Yeah. We are back home safely. We can be able to sing a new song Amen. when we worship in, in the night for what he has done for us during that time, that day. So we must make sure that we don't take these psalms as just, well, okay, it's, it's just a psalm. But when we read these psalms and we you know, put them into practice, it helps bring us closer to God and helps prepare us for what God wants for us to be so that we can be ready for his kingdom. Amen. Amen.
Okay, since, since the elder lingered a little bit more on, on, on the, the new song, yes. I, I just wanted to go back a little bit to um, Revelation 14.3, which speaks about the new song about Moses and the Lamb. Gotcha. And, and just to reference that, the, the references say this song as it were a new song. Hmm. Remember that the, the, the overall theme of the lesson is uh, worship that never ends. Yes. So it appears in heaven as though it's a new song, yes. but it really isn't a new song because even now we are singing about Moses and the lamb yes even now we are having the experiences that we are going through of grace and mercy so we are worshiping god even now but when we get to heaven it's new to the angels right. because they cannot sing that because they did not have that experience but it is a worship pattern that continues forever because we are connected with god we are having that experience with god and when we get to heaven it's not, it's not a new worship experience in terms of worshiping God. It's a continuation Amen. of what Amen. we are doing down here right. in worshiping God. The difference is that we would be in his very glorified presence. total presence, yes. no veil between. Right. But it's here that we are beginning to sing that song yes. of Moses and the Lamb. Amen. 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 As we move on to Tuesday's lesson, Tuesday's lesson asks, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Oh, yes. Let us look at Psalms 15. Psalms 15. David says that, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart, he that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eye a vile person is commend, contempt, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord, he that sweareth to his own heart and changeth not, he that putteth not out his money to usury, nor take it reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Amen? Amen. So the question, who shall abide in your tabernacle? He that walketh uprightly. He that hath a clean heart. Amen? Yes. <clears throat> Brethren, do we have a clean heart? By it's God. personal. Every one of us have to answer that question personally. Yes. You know? But God knows who has a clean heart. Yes. You know, none of us could look at anyone and, and know what their, uh, their life was this week. Mm. What they did right, what they do, did wrong. Right? That, that is not our concern. Okay? Our concern is if we, of ourselves, right, live a life worthy of being in God's presence today. Amen? Amen. The answer given to this psalm is a summary of the requirements already given in God's law and the prophets. The ones whose actions works righteousness and character in his heart are a reflection of God. And we know that the sanctuary was a holy place and everything in it, including the priests, was consecrated. Thus, holiness is a mandatory requirement for entering in the presence of God. Is that the same today? Hmm. It should be. Huh? Anyone want to answer that question? Is that the same today? Because we, as I said earlier, we must know that God's presence is here. And if we are coming into God's presence, right? Hmm. We should make sure, as it, 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 the question is asked, who are worthy of worshiping in God's presence? Amen? Yeah. So I would say that we are all worthy because if God is holy and we 
are worshiping in God's presence, then all of us are supposed to be holy. Amen? Do you agree? Yes. All of us are supposed to be holy. Could All I, right. Could I, could I add to that? Um, yes, to, go ahead, to, to what you just said. Uh, all of us are worthy through Jesus. Amen. Only through Jesus, only covered by his righteousness. And, and um, if we... If we do as we often do because of hu our humanity in that we, we take off our righteous cloak every now and then to, to retaliate with somebody or get back with yes. somebody, we are defeating the work that Christ is doing in us. And so we ought to be his morning, noon, and night. Amen. And so... We are not called to be part-time worshipers in his sanctuary. It gets, it gets more personally and in-depth when the Apostle Paul reminds us not of the heavenly sanctuary or the earthly tabernacle, but he says to you and I, you are right. the temple of, God. of the living God. Amen. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us. The Holy Spirit, God, wants to dwell in us. And so we become holy when the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us. Amen. The Holy Spirit will not abide in an unsanctified vessel. vessel. Mm -hmm. And so... We need that constant cleansing of the Holy Spirit. And he says, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. And so we have to be in the word so that we can have that sanctified life so that we can indeed be, be, be considered holy. Again, none of us, none on, no one is perfect outside of Christ. And so we have to be wrapped up in Christ in order for us to be considered holy mm -hmm. and for our worship to be considered acceptable to God. Amen. Amen. And, and there's an, a question here that asks, what does it mean to be holy? And the elder answered most of it. Uh, but I just want to share with you also that it says, to avoid the things that would separate us from God. This is what we have to make sure that we avoid those things that would separate us from God. And this, the uh, pen of inspiration says here in Lift Them Up, page 341, it says that if the members of the family are not prepared to dwell in peace here, all right, if the members of God's family of the church are not prepared to dwell in peace here, they are not prepared to dwell in the family that shall gather around the great white throne. Yes. Amen? Mm -hmm. So we must understand that this is not just we living life, okay, as a, a haphazard. We, we, we don't care how we live today and how we live tomorrow. We must live our lives, right, in such a way that we are getting close, and I always say this, that every Sabbath we come to church and leave here, we should know that we have been a Sabbath closer yes. to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen? We must always make sure we have that experience. We know that we are a Sabbath closer to Christ's return. So it's a preparation that we are going through, right? And uh, the lesson says here that a blameless life springs from the acknowledgement of God's servants to live in the fear of the Lord, which means to live in unhindered fellowship with God and in submission to his word. A testimony of a devoted and pious life brings praise to God and not to one's own self. Notice that most requirements in Psalms 15 are given in negative terms. This is not about earning God's favor, but about avoiding the things that would separate us from God. Yes. Amen? Amen? That is our duty, not 
uh, God, our duty. Go ahead, Elder King. If we are indeed holy, does that mean that we are no longer what we used to be before we became holy? That's right. You, 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 we, we cannot be holy and be the same as we was before. So the nature changes, which means that the desire changes, which means that that which pleases us change, which means that the activity changes. When we had the information about who will abide in the tabernacle, and you read the list of things that that person would do, if one is holy, truly holy, that means that the nature has changed, which means that the activity would change. That's so right. you would see the evidence of one being holy if, in fact, they are holy. Amen. Amen. I, I, and I, as the elder said, you know, we could only be holy if the Holy Spirit is dwelling inside of us. Yes. And this is why we, uh, you know, well, the prayer meeting group, we know that we've been praying for God, Holy Spirit every day. We ask people to, in your prayers every day, ask for God to baptize you anew with the Holy Spirit. And this is one thing we have to make know that when we ask God that we don't have to say, well, if, it's that, if that's your will, we know that it is his will to baptize us with the Holy Spirit. But we have to want it. We have to long for it. We have to have a desire, a thirst for his righteousness. If we don't have that, right? You know, it wouldn't happen because, you know, we know that the work is going to finish in power yes. and it's us, we, his church is going to be the ones that are going to finish this work. And the only way we can do that is that we have that dunamis power inside of us. Amen. Any thoughts before we, we move on to Wednesday's lessons? Uh, Wednesday's lesson um, is declare his glory among the nations. It begins with Psalm 96. Uh, what manifold aspects of worship are mentioned in this psalm? Psalm 96. If we can go back to um, the first few verses of Psalm 96, uh, let's examine uh, this psalm once again. It begins, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared among all gods or above all gods. For all gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Amen. This psalm, um, of course, clearly shows that the Lord is the only creator God, the God who created all things, including the material that idols are made of. And going down to, psalm, uh, to verse 9, O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Say among the nations that the Lord reigns. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Now, we could uh, continue, but hopefully all of you have taken the time to read this psalm uh, individually. Now, the question, going back to the lesson, uh, the question is, what manifold aspects of worship are mentioned in this psalm? Would anyone like to add uh, their uh, insights at this time? What manifold aspects of the worship of worship are mentioned in this psalm? Uh, one thing I notice here, uh, brother teacher, that the Sabbath lies at the foundation of divine worship because it reminds us of God as our creator and we as his creatures. Yes. So, and, and it shows the uniqueness that Psalms 96, uh, referring uh, 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 to 
Revelation 14, 6 to 12, mm -hmm. about calling the people back to worship God, the creator God. Mm -hmm. Amen? So we see the uniqueness here with the comparison with Revelation 14, 6 to 12, and Psalms 96. So, uh, you know, even those that talk about how they, uh, we are not living in the Old Testament, we're living in the New Testament, but Psalms 96 shows us that it's calling the people back to worship the Creator God. Yeah, and to, uh, to add to that, some of the aspects um, brought out in the psalm, we have, we worship God by bringing an offering. Mm -hmm. We worship God by singing songs. Yes. We worship God by prayer. We worship God by giving testimonies. We worship God by, uh, by sharing the message of salvation with others. Uh, we worship God by, by proclaiming God to be king and judge and creator. So these Amen. are all different aspects that are brought out in the psalm yes. as, as to how it's like a multifaceted approach to worship. It's not yes. just we sing songs. It's, it's the preaching. It's the teaching. It's, 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 you know, it's the healing. It's, it's all of that that makes up and, the path of, of worship. And evangelism. Amen. Yes. Yeah. I would like to ask someone from the audience to read Revelation chapter 14, 6 to 12. Revelation chapter 14, 6 to 12. And you, right, I agree, but <laughs> uh, anyone? Revelation chapter 14, 6 to 12. Okay, we have a reader in the back. Okay. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worships the beast in his image, whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patient of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Amen. Uh, thank you, Elder. Uh, now, the uh, last part of Wednesday's lesson uh, tells us this. The universal appeal of Psalm 96 to worship the Creator and the Judge is reflected in God's final gospel proclamation to the world, the three angels' message of Revelation 12, uh, 14, 6 to 12. In many ways, this psalm seems to incorporate this end time message, creation, salvation, everlasting gospel, worship, and judgment, it's all there. Amen. So, you know, for those who talk about, um, Elder Gill mentioned, the, uh, those who, are, who call themselves the New Testament Christians, there's no such thing. You're either a Christian who believe in the, uh, in the scripture that shaped the message of Jesus Christ, because Jesus was often uh, quoting from Deuteronomy, from the Psalms, and from other passages, uh, Isaiah, uh, other passages of Scripture. So Jesus was not a New Testament Christian. Jesus was an Old Testament Christian. Jesus was a Bible Christian, and that's what we ought to be today. And uh, so the third angel's message of Revelation harkens back to the Psalm. The Psalm 96 about uh, who God is and why he is deserving of our worship today. Amen. Okay, any thoughts before we move on to Thursday? Elder King. Elder King. If we don't worship Jehovah, we're worshiping Satan. Hmm. There's, no, there's no in between. Exactly. The Bible says to whom you yield your members. Yes. It's to who you serve. And so we're either worshiping God all we're worshiping Satan, yes. and, and this is why the last day message is whoever worships the beast in his image yes. compared to who worship God. So it needs to 
we need to understand that there is only one or the other, and that's so important, especially for those who claim to be Christian. Amen. Okay. I wanted us to, to touch briefly, because our time is almost up, on worshiping in spirit and in truth, Amen. Uh, which is an interesting um, subject. Uh, in terms of the psalm, Psalm 51, 16, it talks about, For thou desirest not sacrifices, else I would give it, thou delightest not in burnt offerings. So w what's the problem here? Isn't it the same God who required sacrifices to be done? Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. God required sacrifices to be offered and, and several different sacrifices. So how is it that now he is saying, I don't delight in sacrifices. Uh, I, I don't delight in your burnt offerings when it is the very burnt offerings that uh, the, the, the priest would offer and, and and they will atone and, and sprinkle the blood and his presence will be magnified or, or felt or shown in the temple. How is it that now God is saying that I don't delight in that? What was the cause? What was the problem? Why he is now saying enough of the sacrifices? What is it that God was after in terms of worshiping him in spirit and in truth? I worship I, I believe and uh, you know, the, 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 these sacrifices were pointing to Jesus Christ. Jesus came, the true lamb, the blood that was shed to free mankind was shed. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, who shed his blood for mankind. So because of Jesus' blood, you don't have to have those sacrifices anymore. Even though some people still, I, I, I hear there are people still offer sacrifices, yeah. but God don't need those sacrifices. But even when people used to offer those sacrifices, God wanted people to be penitent in their hearts yes. when they offer these sacrifices, right? So, you know, people used to think that, okay, I could do whatever sin I want to commit, and I could offer sacrifice, and God would forgive me. And even in today's time, people think that because God is a forgiving God, he's a merciful God, I can do anything and ask God for forgiveness. But they must always remember that God says, I will forgive who I want to forgive. All right? So we, we must not try to abuse God, uh, Jesus' uh, blood that he shed on Calvary's cross for our sins. So God wants you to come with a spiritual sacrifice to offer to him when you come to worship him with a clean heart, as Psalms 15 said to us. He that come must worship with a clean heart. Mm -hmm. So let us remember that as we go forward in this life. Amen. 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 Well, our time is uh, expired, mm -hmm. and so we should uh, wrap it up. So, uh, Elder, who has the closing thought? You or? Well, I'll just, I'll just end on that. Um, let's just let's get um, our sister quickly. Okay. Um, if you look at on the back of your book, on Friday's lesson, it was a future thought, and everyone can turn to it. And I like it because it said, central to worship is the need for repentance. True repentance. Repentance includes sorrow for sin and turning away from it. We shall not renounce sin unless we see its sinfulness until we turn away from it in heart, there will be no real change in life. The rest of it, as you read on, is very good and it helps you because if you don't repent, then you can do all the worship you want to do. But God knows the heart. He knows exactly what, you're, what you mean. Mm -hmm. So you're not fooling nobody. We can put on the show and we can pretend that we are sanctified, holy, and filled with the Spirit. But God is the one that you have to really be concerned about at all times, in all things, whatever you do, your time, your day, your food, everything is supposed to be honoring God. Amen. 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 And, and so not to leave you hanging with the question that I asked also, I would like to add the, my simple um, statement to it in terms of worshiping God in spirit and in truth as opposed to him saying, I don't want those sacrifices and those burnt offerings, simply that 
God wants the heart first. Yeah. And so even yeah. simply he's saying in the New Testament, if you have a gift to offer and you come to the altar mm -hmm. and you know that someone has ought against you, mm. you ought to go to that person. Yes. He is saying that I, I, I need the offerings and I need the sacrifices, but I need you first. I need that sincerity of heart with you. Then I will accept your offerings and your gifts. So brothers and sisters, let us seek. Not just, not think about waiting to worship God when we get to heaven. But let us enter this continual phase of a never-ending worship that begins here and now. Amen. And continues on throughout eternity. Amen. Amen. All right, so let us, um, let us go ahead and let us bow our heads and we will pray over the offerings and then we'll have the deacons come and pick them up uh, as we are finished. Go ahead, Elder. Uh, let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the blessings of the week and we thank you for allowing us to come into your place of worship and your presence this morning and to discuss this lesson that you have given to us to help us to draw closer to you. Lord, I pray that you would bless everyone within the sound of our voice and all those who are viewing us online. Accept this offering that we have, uh, would be collected, Lord. And may you continue to guide us and may we continue to long for your soon return. And as we do so, Lord, help us to do what we can to prepare ourselves to be able to do this work that you have called us to do. And Lord, when you come, save us all in your kingdom, we ask, because we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Will the deacons come forward for today's offering, Sabbath school offering?
Sing unto the Lord a new song, for he had done marvelous things. His right hand, his holy arm, had gotten him the victory. The Lord had made known his salvation. His righteousness had he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. He had remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the deeds of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise, rejoice and praise and sing. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and with the voice of a psalm. With trumpets and song of cornet, make a joyful noise before the Lord the king let the sea roar and the fullness thereof the world and they that dwell therein let the floods clap their hands let the hills be joyful together before the lord for he cometh to judge the earth with righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity We set our work aside and leave our cares behind on this day of Sabbath rest. On this your holy day, we've come to give you praise on this day. says remember 
the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughters, nor thy man servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days, and the rest of the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. For God so loved the world that he gave that whosoever should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for just being God. Thank you for this opportunity to be able to fellowship one with another in worship to you, Lord. Thank you for your presence here with us. Draw us closer to you, Father. Shower upon us just that special blessing that you have packaged. And Father, we give you the honor, the praise, and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Happy Sabbath, church. The announcements are as follows, and please pay keen attention. Let's keep our bereaved families in prayer. We continue to pray for the Fuller family for the loss of Sister Joyce Fuller, the daughter of late brother George and Sister Catherine Fuller. Earlier this morning, Sister Elisa Revel, Revel's mother passed away. Her name was Sister Hazel Bunn. Please keep the family in prayer. Religious Liberty Campaign continues. It runs January 13th through March 31st, 2024, and the subscriptions are for $7. The forms are on the bulletin table down front. From the Treasury Department, you can pick up your tithes receipt at the office, or you can have them mailed to you. If you want them mailed to you, please submit your name and address to emssda at gmail.com. Again, that email address is emssda at gmail.com. For Sabbath school, Brother Forbes would like to meet with the members. It would be a virtual meeting tomorrow at 10.30. Please use the prayer link prayer meeting link for that meeting. Again, it's at 10.30 tomorrow. The SDA Aggies are asking, or they're coming back with their Spring Back Into Giving. It's a campaign called Spring Back Into Giving, and this donation drive is for the GTCC early college teachers. And this goes from March 22 through April 6. The donation boxes are placed at the Blair and the McNeil lobby and also in our lobby here at East Market Street. Please donate the following items as they are requesting them. Index cards, pencils, colored pencils, colored dry erase, sorry, erase markers, sticky notes, invisible tape, lamination pockets, alcohol wipes, hand sanitizers, electric pencil sharpeners, copy paper, and post-it pads. The calendar for the week is, continues, and we're asking that you send your announcements to the church clerk by noon on Wednesdays. And today, March 23, we're having children church. They're beginning right now and going to the end of service. Parents, please act accordingly and take your children to the blue room over there. Children choir rehearsal is today after service in the blue room. And tomorrow, men ministry, sorry, today men ministry will meet with Elder, Elder Gill right in front after service. So men ministry members, please come down front right after service to meet with Elder Gill.
the Greensboro Urban Ministry feeding, shelter feeding will be tomorrow. Volunteers are asked to be there at 5 p.m. as dinner is served at 7 p.m. The health food store opens tomorrow, 2 p.m. through 2, 3 p.m. And we're asking that you contact the Browns the day before or 30 minutes prior to 2 p.m. if you want to get items from this food store. Tuesday, March 26th, the Golden Age Society exercise class will be in the Blue Room, 11.30 a.m. through 12.30 p.m. All are welcome. In the upcoming events, we have next Sabbath, March 30th, will be our Easter musical program during divine worship. And a AYS Community Service Outreach will be at a nursing home after service next Sabbath. There will also be bowling for AYS at 7 p.m. We'll have more information coming up on that. And for um, Camp Meeting South Atlantic Conference, Conference Camp Meeting will be June 7th through 15, 2024. Again, the dates for Camp Meeting is June 7th through 15. The applications are on the bulletin table over there. And we have a transfer of membership. We have received a request for a transfer of membership for Sister Helen Butler of East Market Street who desires to unite with the Charlotte Berry and Seventh-day Adventist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. This is the first reading. Sunset next Sabbath, March 20, sorry, sunset next Sabbath, March 29th at 7.33 p.m. And the thought for the week is, the higher you climb is the more you expose. Climb higher and expose Jesus. Have a blessed Sabbath. Thank you, Sister McFarland. We appreciate that. Uh, we just want to praise God for his goodness and his kindness to us. And if you're happy to be in the house of God, let me hear you say amen. I know it may be a little rainy outside, maybe a little cloudy outside, but it ought to be uh, joyous on the inside. Come on, say amen. We ought to have joy on the inside, and we just want to praise God for his goodness and his mercies to each and every one of you, uh, each and every one of us. And as we've come into this worship spot, my prayer is that heaven will come down and glory will fill our hearts. Would like to not only welcome you into the service this morning, those who are here in person, but like to also welcome those who are online. You could have gone anyplace else to worship, but you chose to worship with us and for that, we are eternally grateful. We want you to know that you can put it in the chat, let us know that you're here visiting maybe for the first time or coming back for another time. And we will love to just shout out to you and let you know that we appreciate having you in this virtual space. Are there any individuals who are worshiping with us today uh, that are visiting with us, maybe for your first time, if you stand at this time? We just wanna make sure that we clear the air uh, to make sure everyone is welcomed okay I am um, oh, thank you <laughs> happy Sabbath church happy Sabbath <laughs> um, my name is D Jamerson I am visiting I live in Salisbury and my home church is Anderson first seven day Adventist church um, so I was just in the area and decided to come by amen thank, thank you. you so much for being a part of our family today Praise God, praise God. We're so excited to have you in the service. We're asking God to bless you real, real good. And each and every person who is visiting with us, even in the virtual space. I want to just pause and ask you to just turn around and shake the person's hand next to you. Welcome them, give them a good smile and say welcome to the service this morning. Come on, say amen. What a blessing, what a blessing. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, it's just a blessing to know that we have, we are family, and as a family of faith, we, our prayer is that we continue to encourage each other, uh, and no matter what is happening, we are in lockstep, uh, in prayer and pushing. That says pray until something happens, amen? We're pushing, 
And so we're always making sure that we check on each other and we do want you to know we're lifting each person up in prayer. Thank you so much for your support of the Fuller family and the passing of Joyce Lynette Fuller. Thank you so much for your service on yesterday. Uh, we also want you to continue to pray for the Bunn family and the passing of Sister Hazel Bunn. Uh, talk with Alicia as well as uh, uh, Chris Revelle this morning was praying with them and just in, encouraging them to hang on in there. Come on, say amen. Uh, it's not easy to lose a loved one, especially your parent. Uh, it's just it's just one of those gut-wrenching situations that happen that you've got to process. But I'm so glad uh, that this is not how the story ends. Come on, say amen. We've got some hope. Come on, say amen. This entire season is about hope. Amen. It's about the one who's hung up and, and went to the cross and went to the grave but then stayed there. Come on, say amen. So we're looking forward for that day, and we just want to encourage you to encourage those around you in prayer and support. We continue to pray for Pat Bowen as she continues to uh, heal. We're asking God for healing. Uh, and I, I told her, I know what the doctor says. But you know what? The doctor doesn't have the last say. Amen. And so we continue to pray for uh, Sister Pat. We continue to pray for all of those. Uh, Brian uh, Barrett, as he heals, we're so glad to know that uh, Brother Jackson is doing well. Amen. He came back to church already. Glad to see uh, Elder McFarlane back with us as well. Uh, so good to know that God is still in the healing business. And he's still in the restoration business. If you want a, a, a miracle, just look over and see Sister Gail and tap her. And, and just give God the praise. Come on, say amen. God is still doing what he does. And we give him the celebration of praise for who he is, what he continues to do. Let's continue also to, to give. We have a very special initiative. You've been hearing about it. We are erecting the entire walk through sanctuary at camp meeting. And if you go on the conference website, they are actually soliciting uh, each member to give $5. We've given ours already. We already sent it in. And so we invite you to take advantage of that. This will be a, a, a special walk through process every year to teach the one message that this church has been given has been the sanctuary service. You didn't hear that. We borrowed everything else. The one message God has given this church is the sanctuary service. Uh, and as you look at this, God has called us into this time uh, to share uh, his judgment, our message. Amen. Let the folk know that uh, the hour of his judgment is come. It's not come in. It's here. Come on, say amen. And we are living in those times, and so we invite you to uh, get online, and if you don't do it online, if you want to put it in an envelope, we will still send it to the conference, uh, and we invite each person to take advantage of that. Every year, they're going to erect it and have a walkthrough, a vivid, virtual look. You, actually, you can actually walk through it and see it and touch it, amen, and understand it. Uh, so what a blessing. So we're looking forward to you contributing for that. Uh, and, and today, uh, we have a celebration of uh, Elder King and, and his wife. Uh, 46 years, is that? Is that 46? Would you stand? Stand, 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 amen. 46, and looking good. Amen. The anniversary, we praise God. And we just want you to continue to uh, continue to pray for all of our families. Uh, happy birthday to all those for this month. Amen. Amen. And we praise God as we have our service today. My prayer is that heaven will come down and glory will fill our hearts. Good morning and happy Sabbath. 
So I am here this morning to do the education ministry spotlight. My name is Simone Smith and I'm the education ministry leader here at East Market Street. And I've always had a passion for education. My mother was a teacher for 20 years and I just always loved the idea of um, being a student and teaching. And I've also had a passion for youth ministries, for an, everybody from birth, pre-K, not just pre-K to 12, but pre-K to, as they say, 16, which is like college and beyond. And we have church members who are in all those categories. So what does education ministry entail? Well, it provides opportunities for students to do seven things that I'll go really quickly through. To accept Jesus Christ as their savior, that's one. Two, to allow the Holy Spirit to transform students' lives. Three, to fulfill the commission of preaching the gospel to all the world. Four, to develop the whole person concept in each student. Five, educating students to accept service as a way of life. Six, to be sensitive to the needs of people, whether at home or in society. And seven, to become, for these students to become active members of the church. So while the church, of course, promotes Christian education for all students, we realize that there will be students in secular schools. And ed ministry is also aimed at supporting those students to accomplish all the previous seven points that I just mentioned. And that's where public campus ministries comes in. Public Campus Ministries is also known as Adventist Campus Fellowship, and it ministers to Adventist students and faculty on public university and college campuses. And that is a main wing of what the education ministry of the church is tasked to do, is to support these public campus ministries. We are so grateful to God that our university neighbors, right behind us, North Carolina A&T State University, is the proud host of an Adventist campus fellowship, and they proudly call themselves the SDA Aggies. So Miss Bignall, who, I, who is waving to you right there, yes, Baisha Bignall, she's the vice president of SDA Aggies, and is also the person who is spearheading the supply drive that the announcements talked about earlier. So the Education Ministry Committee members serve as faculty advisors to the SDA, as a faculty advisor to the SDA Aggies, and also actively support these collegiates by always reaching out to them. We make sure that we host lunches here at East Market Street and at different people's homes. The SDA Aggies, they're a vibrant lot. All the college students, it's not only Aggies um, who are in the collegiate ministry. We have Spartans from UNCG as well, and also from other universities. But they're very vibrant. In fact, they just had their bi-weekly Vespers yes yesterday evening. So if you feel like something is missing in your Friday evening routine, you know, having Friday evening Vespers, the young people are leading the way. So just something to think about. So with the collegiates, education ministry students and committee members have also done Meals on Wheels deliveries. We have partnered with Washington Montessori School as lunch buddies and reading buddies. We've provided care packages, not to the students who are here all the time, but to our local EMS race students as they are away at their colleges in all parts of the country. We've organized an impactful contribution of coats to Give a Kid a Coat campaign with your kind donations. With personal ministries and facilities teams, the Education Committee and the SDA Aggies collected and packaged close to 1,900 diapers for the Greater Triad North Carolina Diaper Bank. And we've also conducted back to school drives for the teachers at Washington Montessori. We've also had graduation celebrations for all our graduating students from pre-K to university, and we expect to have another one in June. We also, with the South Atlantic Women's Ministries, the Education Committee has sent two of the collegiates to the Southern Union Women's Ministries Conference that took place in Orlando last August, and they were all just really overwhelmed with how beneficial it was to them. It was a true blessing. 
So thanks to everyone who supports the collegiates, who supports all the students in the church, and thanks to all of you who set a foundation over years and decades by interacting with college students and making sure that our, even when the church school was here, supporting students. And we hope that that will continue. We know that will continue in the future and set a foundation for excellence in education here at East Market Street. We welcome any new members and ministries who want to partner with education ministries. Just get in touch with me or anyone on the team, including Sherelle Troxler and many others who have I've asked, but I'm not going to say their names in case they're saying, oh, I didn't commit, but definitely we have many people whose heart is with education ministry, and we welcome many more. We thank God because we will continue equipping young people for service as an army, rightly trained, not by might, not by power, but by the Holy Spirit to fulfill this work of bringing the gospel to the whole world. Thank you. And please, as um, Ms. Bignall would remind us, please don't forget the supply drive that we have going. There are boxes in the atrium at, with flyers, and you can also contact us with any information. Thank you for allowing us to spotlight Education Ministries. Good morning and happy Sabbath East Market Street. It is now time for us to lift our voices to heaven. Would you please join me in standing? As we sing this morning's hymn of worship, hymn 229, all hail the power of Jesus' name, we'll be singing all four stanzas. that first verse all hail the power of let angels prostrate fall bring forth the royal diadem and crown of the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him lord of all to him all majesty ascribe and crown Crown him, Lord. 
Amen. You may be seated. And happy Sabbath. We want to continue our worship in prayer. And we want to, this day and throughout the week, remember our sick and shut in. We also want to remember the Fuller family in prayer this day and throughout the week. Also, I ask you to pray for my sister-in-law, Alicia Ravel, my brother, Elder Chris Ravel, and the Bunn family for losing um, his mother-in-law, Hazel Bunn. Um, you know, if I can confess, I am so tired and really sick of death. I, I was just thinking about 2015, I lost my dad. 2016, I lost my oldest sister. 2020, I lost my mother-in-law. 2021, I lost my next to oldest sister. And it kind of just beats down on you, you know? And you've been in the faith all your life and you're, you're praying, Lord, you know, heal your family members that are sick and you're asking, but God knows best, and those prayers are not answered. But you know, the devil does mess with you. You're human. And sometimes you question, God, do you care? But then God has a way uh, of bringing you comfort and, and letting you know he does care. And so I know that many of you today are going through something, whether it's unemployment, manage your finances, relationships, sickness, and you want to know whether God's care or not. And I want to give you an affirmation that he does. I want to share a, a remark, a brief remark, to let you know he cares. A couple of weeks ago, I was reading on the internet, and scientists have now discovered, and they believe that we have approximately about 8 trillion planets in our Milky Way galaxy system. And what's interesting about that, in early writings on page 39 and 40, Ellen White says that there are many unfallen planets. So our parents, Adam and Eve, they fell to sin. Satan comes to our planet. He's cast down. Revelation, in fact, chapter 12, verse 7 says he was cast down. And, you know, he did get our parents to sin. And I can imagine now how he said, well, look, you, get, you got eight trillion plants or trillions of planets. If I had eight trillion dollars and lost one, I'd say, oh, well. So I can see him in my mind saying, I got this. This planet will belong to me. I will be their God. These will, people will be mine. They will serve me. But, you know, it must have bogged his mind to see the Son of God come down just for one planet. He wouldn't let one planet go. Came down for one planet and he saw him go through all he went through and suffered and died on a cross. That's an affirmation that God loves us. It, it lets us know that when he tells us in Jeremiah chapter 29, 11, he says what? I know the plans I have for you. Plans of peace and not of evil to bring to expect it. He tells us in 3 John 2, Beloved brother, all things I wish you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prosper. These affirmations in the word of God tells us and it lets us know that God loves us. Would you stand with me for a brief word of prayer as we worship God in prayer? Heavenly Father, my God, I want to thank you so much for what you did for us. I want to thank you so much. So many planets of unfallen world, but you did not give up on us. You did not say, oh, well, and cast it to the side. The creator, thank you, Father, sending your son. You came, died on a tree for us, Lord. Thank you so much. And thank you for allowing your Holy Spirit to abide with us, to give us the character that you would want us to have. Lord, I know that you love this church. You have blessed this church. And you have a mission for this church, Lord. No, we, we're not perfect people, but we're striving to love one another, Lord. We, we're striving to read the word of God and pray for one another, Lord. And we know that as you build us, each person as an individual, it will strengthen our families. It will strengthen our church. It will strengthen our community. 
So, Lord, we ask that you will bless our church. Bless everyone here. Bless, help us with our struggles, Lord. And we ask that you will continue to help us to evolve into the character that you have us to be. And, Lord, we want to pray for our pastor. We want to pray for his ministry and his wife's ministry to, together, the two on one. We want to pray for his family. We want to pray for his grandkids, Lord. We know that you have given him a message to give us today. And we pray, Lord, that you will help him deliver. That will be encouraging to us, Lord. And Lord, I, I, the pastor has talked about macular degeneration, the challenge he had with his eyes. And I thought about Apostle Paul having problems with his eyes. And he's asked, Paul asked you many times, but you said your grace is sufficient. Your, Strength is made perfect in our weakness, Lord. So whatever, we, we ask that you would bring healing to our past eyes, but if not, we pray that you give him the spirit to be able to deal with it. Lord, we ask that you continue to grow our church, bless our church. Let this be a loving church and help us fulfill the mission that you have for this church and bless our families. And most importantly, Lord, save us into your kingdom when you come. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. starting with verse 6 the word of God says for I am the Lord I do not change therefore you are not consumed O sons of Jacob yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them return to me and I return to you says the Lord of hosts but you said in what way shall we return will a man rob God yet you have robbed me but you say in what way have we robbed you in tithes and offering, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. At this time, would our deacons come forth and lift this morning tithes and offering? If I were not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings that there would not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he would not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts, and all nations will call you blessed, 
for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for all these funds that have been given today. I want to thank you for the funds that have been given online, Lord. Pray that all the funds that we have collected would go to fulfill our mission, Lord, to spread the gospel in our vineyard. Bless these funds now. To your, in your name's honor. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. story. So beautiful today. What is this? It's a bag. Any other ideas? You like snacks? But well, it's a lunch bag. Oh, that's what we're using it for today. All right. So let's see. my napkin, my spoon and my fork. What else do I need? Food. Ooh, that sounds good if you need to have a fork and a spoon. Well, I have some food here today, and I'm going to see if you really like it or not, okay? Today I have some green beans. What's wrong with this? That's baby food. Baby food? Oh my good. Well, let's see what else I have. Oh, you're going to love this. Carrots. Baby food? Is it? Well, let's see what else I have. You might like this too. You might like this. Now, this has to be delicious. It's carrots, sweet corn, and pumpkin. But it's still baby food. Oh, well, let's see. Got two more things here. It's sweet corn and green beans. Still baby food? I think I have one more. Still baby food. Mangoes, is that better? It's still baby food. Well, you know what? The interesting thing about today's lesson is that sometimes we feed on baby food. And we can't grow on baby food because there comes a point when you have to have what kind of food? Well, that's real. Isn't this real food? Yes. Well, what's wrong with it? It's for babies. It's for babies. Babies don't have the teeth to chew on the food, so we have to give them baby food. But you all outgrown baby food. So today we're going to talk about growing up in Christ, because when you first start out, you're using baby lessons. We give you felt board lessons, but we've got to grow up in Christ. So now that we know that you're no longer wanting to eat baby food, 
we're going to consider some verses that help us to think about growing up in Christ. And I need just a few volunteers who will read some of these for us. Come on up. It was for babies. You're exactly right. Okay, if you'll read that one. Hold on one sec. I need another volunteer. Okay. Come on. I need another volunteer who will read one for us. Anyone else? Okay. I need two more people that will read these for us. Can you read it for us? Come on up and I'll read it for you. Come on. Is that your brother? And he's so handsome. Do I have one more person that will read one for me? Okay. All righty. So we're going to start. He's going to, I'm going to read. Oh, isn't that sweet? Okay. All right. Read yours. Start. Okay. Peter. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Witness for Christ by your life and words, showing yourself to be a disciple of Christ. Trust in the Holy Spirit to direct you and empower your daily life and witness. Okay, thank you. Obey God moment by moment. Jesus says, whoever obeys my commandments, loves me, will be loved by my Father. Thank you. Read God's word daily. Thank you. Go, go to God in prayer daily. Yes, and I'm reading it for... For my little one who says, that's baby food. Trust God for everything in your life. Thank you so much. One of the things that we know is that we do, in fact, outgrow baby food. Now, when my children were little, there were things they tr truly did not like. Green beans was one of them. So what I would do is I would put the green beans on the spoon, put a little bit of apricots on the front of the spoon, and give it to them. Now that lasted for just a little while. After a while they began to look around and see, I think there's something behind that apricots that I really don't like. Well, there's some things in life that we really don't like, but God sweetens things for us. He takes the pain and the bitterness out of some things that we go through. Even though we're going through difficult times, and as you grow, you'll find that your appetite will increase for the word of God. And that's what we want you to do, to grow, up in Christ. So as you learn Bible verses, please remember that one Bible verse will lead to the memorization of another Bible verse. And these verses will help you throughout life for the difficulties that will come your way. Because as you said, you're no longer babies, but we're growing up in Christ. Who'd like to offer prayer for us? Dear Jesus, please help us to grow of baby lessons and to grow into your lessons more. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And we'd like to thank the parents who bring their children because they're going to grow up and occupy positions in the church and represent the Lord, especially in these days and times. Because not only will older of us be going through the time of difficulty, they're going to go through it too. And they need to be prepared to give, a, give, to give a witness for what they do. And we want them to be saved in God's kingdom. Are you, are you with me? Saved in God's kingdom. All of our precious little ones. Thank you so much. Thank you for your help. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Happy, Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading comes from John chapter 20, verses 6 to 9. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the line, line and clothes lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the line and clothes, but folding together in a piece place by itself. 
Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. May Jesus bring his angels down upon us.
Praise God for my colleagues who served us today. Uh, we just want to thank God for what we heard from our children's story. And we just praise God the children's church is happening now, even for our young people. What a blessing to know that God is good. He is worthy to be praised. And what a blessing to know that in spite of all that's happening all around us, God is still large. God still is in charge. What a blessing, what a blessing. I did not know why it was that the Lord was sending me to where I'm going to go today. But when I got that call about Sister Bun's passing, the Lord said to me, that's why I took you where I took you. This week has been chock full of, of losses. On Tuesday, I went to 
my neighbor's mother's funeral. First time I ever went to a Catholic funeral in my life. Very different. Very different. I could see why Martin Luther tacked those 95 theses to the door. There's a lot of preamble to get them into heaven. But that was an interesting experience. And yesterday we came for the service of Sister Fuller. And this morning hearing the loss of Sister Hazel Bunn. I, w I want you to know that God designed a message today to not only speak to those who are hurting in their hearts, even now, but to speak to us who are here today. A message simply entitled, The Gospel According to Grave Clothes. The gospel according to grave clothes. Let us pray, Father, as we open your word. There is much you want to say to us. And God, we are pausing to listen. Your manservant has written such details to teach us. The one that was closest to you than anyone else. Laid out for us some pertinent information that God as we glean it as we behold it, it will anchor our faith in you even more securely. For all the hurting hearts today, God, we ask that you put your arms of love around each and every person. Through what will be shared today, we're in this season of reflection. But God, we want to see how you are showing us and sharing with us the importance of looking at the signs you've left for us. Now, Lord, I ask that you hide this lump of clay behind the cross. Let people not see me, but let them hear from you. God will be careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. And as I speak, I listen. Touch even my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. There is something amazing about the Gospels that captures my attention. And something very unique about this last gospel. This is, no, just leave it there. Just leave it there. Leave it there. Perfect, perfect. And you'll see why. I said someone had thought about it before I even preached it. Thank you so much for that. We appreciate that, Dr. Troxler. So here it is, when we think in terms of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we find out that all four gospel writers wrote about what they had personally experienced with Jesus Christ. They chronicled his life, and they all came from different aspects and different angles. But when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as a whole, 
It paints a picture of not only a God who came and was born, a God who came and lived, but a God who came and died, went to the tomb and rose again, a God who left this area. And as you read the rest of the story in Acts and, and beyond, you find out that he left here and promised to come back. Come on, say amen. What a blessing to see the tapestry that God has allowed to unfurl and to unfold. I, I look very carefully at the book of John this week. And what captured my attention was the 20th chapter of that book. For you see, the 20th chapter opens up with the first day of the week. It opens up with a lady coming to the sepulcher. It opens up with this lady named Mary Magdalene that came early. While it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, And she came there and seeth the stone rolled away. I want you to hear that. I want that to sink into your mindset. Here is Mary Magdalene. She comes. It's yet dark. And as she comes to the place that she had just left on Friday, she had kept the Sabbath. And now early Sunday morning, she's coming to be close to Jesus. Listen to me. There's nothing Jesus could do for her now. He's dead. The hands that healed are now lifeless. And she comes to the sepulcher while it's yet dark. And the Bible says she seeth the stone rolled away. And she goes into panic mode. She goes into what mode? She goes into panic mode. When she sees the stone has been rolled away, she runneth and cometh to who? Simon Peter and the other what? Disciple whom Jesus loved. By the way, that's John. Come on, say amen. And saith unto them, what? They have what? Taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and what? We know not where they have laid him. Think about that. He was crucified on Friday. He was hung up for all the world to see. He died on Friday, gave up the ghost. Chapter 19 covers that, and we'll go there in just a moment. But here it is on Sunday morning. This woman comes to the tomb. And she actually sees the stone roll away. The Bible didn't say she went and looked. She saw the stone rolled away. She runs and gets Simon Peter. And she runs and gets John. And she says to them, they have stolen the Lord's body away. We don't know where they have laid him. And I want you to understand, Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple came to the sepulcher. And I want you to see that they both are running, but one outruns the other. Hello. And the Bible says, 
The one who outruns the other. In other words, John runs faster than Peter. Come on, say amen. When he comes, the Bible says he stoops down and looks in and saw the clothes lying, yet went he not in. And the Bible says, then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes but wrapped together in a place by itself. The Bible says, then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. I want you to go back to Friday when they took Christ up to the cross, marched him up Golgotha's hill, stretched his hands out and stretched his feet and nailed him to a cross. He had done nothing wrong. Three and a half years of ministry. He'd healed the sick. Raised the dead. Five thousand souls <laughs> worked with and worked on. He fed. Come on, say amen. I want you to think about this. Here is it. He has come to it seems like an end. And the Bible says that everything that John chronicles, I want you to hear this and take the time this week and go through the book of John. John writes everything and he actually writes it for a reason. He says everything that is given and everything that's written, there are so many things that Christ did that's not even in this book, but he did it for a specific reason. I want you to look at John, the 20th chapter, look at verse 30 and 31. Verse what? 30 and 31. The Bible says in, in, in John, uh, the, the 20th chapter, verse 30 and 31, and I want us to pause there for a second uh, so that we could understand. It says, uh, and what? And many other what? Signs truly did who? Jesus in the presence of what? His disciples, which are what? Not written in the what? In the book. It says, but what? But these are written that what? He might what? Believe that who? Jesus is the what? Christ, the son of what? And that what? Believe in, he might what? Have a life through his name. In other words, everything that's written, God has actually put a code to it. Everything that's written, God has done it for a purpose, a specific reason. And so here it is. Uh, every time you see John writing, he's actually saying, uh, Christ did this. Christ did that so the scriptures might be fulfilled. And the rationale is every time you do something, every time Christ did something, John chronicled it in such a way. And the only purpose he chronicled it in that way was so that eventually the light bulb will go off in our minds and we'll say, aha, he must have been the son of God. So even at the cross, when Christ said, I thirst, so the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they pierced him, 
so the scriptures might be fulfilled. And here it is, uh, we find uh, here in the 19th chapter of the book of, of John uh, 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 something very interesting. Looking at uh, verses 37 and 38. The Bible says uh, in the book of John, uh, looking at verses 37 and 38, I, I, I want you to see something that's happening here. Now, now Christ has bowed his head and, and he has given up the ghost. Uh, he is dead. Have mercy. Uh, in, in verse 30, he is, he is dead. And, and so here it is. Uh, the Bible says something is happening here. Uh, Jesus is dead. And verse 38 of, of John, the 19th chapter says, and after this, who? Joseph of Arimathea being a what? Disciple of Jesus, but how? Secretly for the fear of the Jews uh, did what? Besought Pilate that he might what? Take away the body of Jesus and uh, what? And Pilate gave him leave uh, and he came therefore and what else? He took the body of Jesus. And the Bible says, and there came also who? Nicodemus, which at what? At first came to Jesus by what? Night. And they bought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. By the way, this weight was the amount that you should use for a king. Come on, say amen. And here it is. They brought this mixture. And they took the body of Jesus. And the Bible says they wound it in linen clothes. With the spices. As the manner of the Jews is to bury. I want you to think about this. A lot of times you have hope. As long as there's life, you have hope. But when a person closes their eyes, it hits you. It's real. When the hearse pulls up, it's real. It hits you. When you actually have to go and pick out grave clothes, it hurts, it's, it's real. When you take your loved one and, and you see that loved one wrapped up as Jesus was. I thought about this. Here are two individuals that have come and the Bible says Joseph of Arimathea was serving Christ secretly. Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night in John the third chapter and asked him, uh, uh, teacher, uh, I know thou art from God but the, because no one could do these miracles except God be with him. And Jesus had a conversation about the new life and the new birth and told him unless a man be born again of the water and of the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus went to night school. Come on, say amen. But God got him right. And now, at the very end of the life of Christ, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea comes to the forefront to actually take Christ down, and they wrap him in grave clothes. In John 11th chapter, we find that uh, Jesus had come to Lazarus' place. Lazarus was dead. It asked him to come, and, and he delayed yet a little longer. And by this time, Lazarus was stinking. But Jesus asked them to roll away the stone. Remember that? And Jesus prayed, and he called forth Lazarus by name, and the Bible says, he that was dead came forth, bound with grave clothes, and a napkin about his face. And the Lord told them, loose him, and what? And let him go. I want to reference that because here it is, they have, they have done the same thing to Jesus. They have wrapped him 
in grave clothes. I want you to hear this very carefully because I'm going somewhere. You see, anytime grave clothes are wrapped on a person, it tells you that it's over. It tells you it's done. But I want you to understand the mere fact that Christ died and he was wrapped in grave clothes, Christ went through everything that we will ever have to go through. Yesterday at the cemetery, we saw all of these graves, all of these flowers. My wife talked about that last night. She says, honey, I was overwhelmed with how many folk have died. And all of these folk are out there. And I'm seeing more and more. And my friends, I want you to understand, every time we come to the spot and the place where people die, it's a reminder of our mortality. But the great thing about this message is this. Jesus actually went through everything that you and I will ever go through. He went through the loss just like you and I went through the loss. He actually had on grave clothes like you and I will have if the Lord would delay his coming and would put to sleep when grave clothes are wrapped up. It seems like it's all over. And the grave clothes teaches a lesson to us. Death comes to all of us. When Christ went and they wrapped him in grave clothes, I'm so glad that John, the 19th chapter, said they found a sepulcher. In fact, it was Joseph's new tomb. No man has ever laid there. And when they wrapped Christ up and they put him in the tomb and the stone sealed the mouth of the tomb, Two things that happened, if you look in Matthew, the 27th chapter, you'll find out that when Christ died, there was an earthquake. Come on, say amen. When he bowed his head, there was an earthquake. And when you look in chapter 28, when he got up, there was an earthquake. Oh, you didn't hear me. When he died, there was a what? Earthquake. And when he got up, there was an earthquake. Why? Because the angel came to roll away the stone. But here in John, the 20th chapter, Mary Magdalene don't understand that yet. In fact, the Bible says in John, the 20th chapter, verse 9, that even John and the disciples did not even know, did not recognize about the resurrection by that time. So they had come in. They had not even comprehended Christ dying. They understood that he might die, but they had not locked in the, the concept of the resurrection yet. And so here it is. Christ has been put in a tomb, wrapped in grave clothes. And grave clothes tells us something very special, that we all will have to pass this way sometime. But early Sunday morning, when Magdalene came, Mary Magdalene came and saw the stone rolled away, uh, and people asked, why was the stone rolled away? Because kings don't open doors. Come on, say amen. They just get up and walk. Come on, say amen. Servants open doors. Mary didn't get it yet. So Peter and John hears that they've stolen the body of Christ, and uh, they actually rush to the sepulchre. John outruns Peter, and when he gets there, John looks in, and he's surprised he doesn't go in. But by the time Peter comes, they both go in, and the Bible said they saw the linen clothes lying. When I looked in the research, I found out that what they actually saw was the linen clothes actually rolled up. in the spots where it ought to be. But they looked and they saw a napkin. 
the napkin that covered his face. They saw it folded in one place. The Bible says, the other disciple taught my John, when he came and he saw, he believed. I kept asking myself, what is it that John saw that made him believe? He did not know about the resurrection. The Bible says that. But when he saw what he saw, the light bulb went on. In researching, I found out something special. You see, the gospel, according to grave clothes, tells me that no matter how much wealth I have, how much strength I have, if I keep on living, I'm going to die. And somebody's going to wrap me. Just like they wrapped Jesus Christ. But the difference in this message is John comes and Peter comes and he sees the linen clothes lying there. I'm so glad that the gospel teaches me that dead things need to stay in the grave. Oh, you didn't hear me. The first thing we find out is it says that we all will have to pass this way if Christ doesn't come soon. But the good news about the grave clothes, the gospel according to the grave clothes, is that whenever you have grave clothes, grave clothes remain in the grave. You didn't hear me. What happened with, 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 with Lazarus in John the 11th chapter? When he got up out of the grave and he was alive, what did Christ say to them? Loose him and what? Let him go. In other words, uh, grave clothes ought to be in the grave. No, oh, you didn't hear me. But I want you to understand something very special. When I looked at this very carefully, I saw a message. I saw the symbolism, and I began to shout all over myself because I recognize here in the culture of that time, everybody knows something about servants. You know why Jesus was dealing with Simon and dealing with the fact that he was invited to Simon's house and, 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 and Simon did not have a servant for him to wash his feet, did not anoint his head with oil. But Mary came and Mary washed his feet with her hair, with her tears, and wiped his feet with her, her hair and, and anointed him with an a, 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 a anoint, a ointment of spikenard. And, 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 and Christ said, that's for my burial. That was a custom. If you invited somebody into your place for, for lunch or for dinner, you had a servant to wash their feet. You also put in an olive oil with, with some nice essence on it, and you anointed them. That was a protocol. When Simon says, if he was really the son of God in his mind, in his heart, he would know what type of woman is touching him. And Christ had to rebuke him. Everything is symbolic. Everything is there for a reason. There's a servant-master relationship. And what happened in the tomb, this is where I want to go. This is what I want you to see. When John comes and he sees the linen clothes lying there, and he sees the napkin perfectly folded by itself, he had an aha moment. Why do you say aha, preacher? Because normally... A servant will come and they will literally set the table for the master. They'll make sure at dinner that everything is in place that the master needs. They'll make sure that everything is, is coordinated, coordinated. Everything is at the best possible spot. And when the master comes and sits down to eat, the servant sits outside of the master's purview. He's right outside right here. He's right on the side over here. He doesn't touch the table. He's watching. He's looking. He's waiting to serve. And there's a signal 
and a sign that the master gives. You see, they ate with their hands. And when the table was set, the master will eat. And if the master had completed his meal, he'll take his napkin and he'll wipe his beard. He'll wipe his fingers. And he'll do all of this. And if he was done with the meal, he'll wad it up and throw it down. He's saying, I'm finished. I'm done. It's over. See, I want you to understand, on the cross when Jesus cried out, it is finished. The devil thought he said, I'm done, I'm finished. When Christ cried out on the cross, I'm, it is finished, and he bowed his head in death, the devil says, I got you. I got you, and you can't get me loose. But what the devil forgot was there's another symbol. See, when the servant sees the master eating, and the master has completed his meal, he wipes his hand. He does what he does, but he folds the napkin and he lays it down. He's actually saying to the servant, I'm coming back. It's not over. I want you to understand when John walks in that place and he sees the linen, how it's laid out, and he sees the napkin that was above Christ's head folded and put aside. Automatically in his mind, he saw the picture. He understood that Christ was not stolen. His body was not stolen. Nobody came and robbed the grave. Christ declared to the multitude, he says, yeah, destroy this body. And in three days, I will raise it up again. No man takes my life. I lay it down and I have the power to pick it up again. John understood that they hadn't stole Christ's body. Christ got up. And Christ left a symbol. I ain't done yet. I've conquered death and the grave, and my ministry ain't done. And in Acts, when he was walking, going towards the Mount of Olives, and he ascended up, he was taken up out of their sight, and the angel looked and said to the disciples, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken out of you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. In other words, I'm coming back. It ain't done yet. The joy and the gospel of grave clothes teaches us that the Lord leaves symbols there. When you look very carefully, it was Joseph's new tomb. In other words, it's called temporary housing. <laughs> you see, with Christ, he changes the grave from a permanent residency to just temporary housing. And when he died, like we all will die, he died for our sins. He, he died for our redemption. He went to the cross. He bled and died for us, and he went to the grave for us. I'm so glad he did not say, I am finished. On the cross, he said, it is finished. I've completed this task. But I want you to understand, I folded the napkin to remind you, I'm coming back. I'm coming back, I'm not done here. I want you to understand, Jesus did it all. He left 
evidence for us. And so every time I think about loved ones dying in Christ, I remember what he did in the tomb. The linen clothes was lying there because dead things need to stay in dead places. But he left a reminder. I'm coming again. I'm coming again. I'm coming again. And for 40 days, he spent the time with his disciples, sharing with them, showing them that you know it, it ain't over. He said, I'll go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And family members, I want you to understand, church family, we're going to have more and more deaths as we come closer to the coming of Christ. But folk, remember the napkin. Come on, say amen. Hold on to it. Understand that it's not over. Jesus is soon to come. My heart breaks when the saints of God are laid to rest. When I start thinking about what God has promised, what Christ has done with his own death, his own resurrection, his own ascension, and his own promise to come again. Oh, my friends, in my heart of hearts, I throw up my hands and I join John and I said, God, I believe. I believe. I understand you had to do it, but I'm so glad you did. I'm so glad you tasted death for me. I'm so glad you went to the cross for me. I'm so glad you went down into the grave for me. But thank you, God, that you didn't stay there. You got up. You ascended back to heaven. And you're coming again. Every season that comes around reminds us that God has put breadcrumbs. He's left evidence. He's left indications to us that it's going to be all right. When I saw the grave clothesline, I said it teaches a gospel. We all must go that way. And yes, even Christ died for us. He went to the grave for us. But the gospel didn't stop there. Because early Sunday morning, there was an earthquake. Come on, say amen. Angel came to roll away the stone because kings don't open doors. And God left an opening so that we could come and walk in and look in and peer in and find nothing but grave clothes. But we'll find a napkin folded reminding us I'm coming back. Today our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. And no matter how we hurt, no matter what we feel, God has left through the pen of John information that gives us gladness and gives us hope as we look into the empty tomb. And it's empty because he's alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's gone back to heaven now. But he promised I'm going to come again. And the question is, are you going to be ready? Am I going to be ready? What type of relationship are we going to have in the meantime? What type of commitment will we make to see him in peace? Will we be able to say like John after seeing everything, Lord, I believe. 
the light bulb has gone on in my mind. They didn't steal you. You just got up. Ah! You got up. Because no man takes my life, Christ says. I lay down and I have the power to pick it up again. What a blessing to know that we serve a living Savior. Come on, say amen. What a blessing to know that he's alive. Death couldn't keep him in the ground. He's alive. And because he lives, we too shall live again. If you're happy to hear that and you're praising God for the revelation, let me hear you say amen. Give God the praise today. Thank you, Lord, for telling us you're not done. You're coming back. You're coming back. Let the church say amen. Thank you, Pastor, for such a sermon. Uh, what a word. Now, there is a men's ministry meeting and Sabbath school meeting uh, right after service today. Uh, shall we stand for the benediction? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for blessing us with such a word today. We ask, Lord, that you allow us to meditate upon your goodness throughout this week. Bless us and keep us, protect our families as we leave this place, Lord. Help us to let our light shine and then bring us all back again to the next point in time. In Christ's name I pray, amen. seated for a moment of silent meditation. Oh, 